Good morning, everyone. We're going to start this morning's business with general questions. And the first question is from Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on ensuring that the six unlicensed weirs on the River Tyne in East Lothian are properly authorised and provided with fish passages and for what reason this work did not start in 2017 as planned. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, one fish pass was in fact completed in 2016. Options are currently under development for three others and two weirs have been provisionally assessed as passable for fish at present. Ian Gray. Uh, I thank the uh, Minister for that helpful answer. Can she uh, tell me if the uh, original plan to complete all of this work by 2021 uh, is still possible? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in a global sense, uh, by global I mean Scotland-wide, the plan was to uh, finish all of the work uh, by 2027. Uh, there are uh, at present, uh, there is at present active work going on uh, in terms of three of the weirs. I've indicated that one ha has been completed, um, that two are classified as being clear for fish, um, and that uh, three, uh, as I understand it, there is active uh, work uh, taking place, um, and uh, that work is completing. Now, I have a great deal of detail of what I understand to be seven uh, weirs, um, although the uh, member has asked about six, and I'm very happy to share that detailed information with him if he wishes to speak to me after today. Thank you. Question number two, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the affordability for patients of using bedside televisions in the hospital. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, across NHS Scotland, patient entertainment services are provided either free in-house or through Hospedia's bedside entertainment services, which are purchased uh, by patients voluntarily and are in addition to communal telephones and televisions. Uh, we recognise that television provides respite to many patients and the importance of technology in enabling patients to remain connected. We are currently working with NHS directors of estates to establish the feasibility of free bedside entertainment to be supplied via Wi-Fi across NHS Scotland. NHS Lothian are currently trialling free patient Wi-Fi services, including access to video streaming. And if successful, we would hope to extend this within other NHS boards. Edward Mountain. And I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. At £9.90 a day in the Highlands, it is extremely expensive to watch television. They entered a 15-year contract, which is due to expire in June of this year. Will the Cabinet Secretary give me an undertaking that she will work with NHS Highland to make sure that patient television is more affordable to allow patients to see television during the course of their stay in the hospital, which may in some cases be for long periods? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm very happy to give uh, Mr Mountain uh, that undertaking. He is, of course, right that the current uh, contract the NHS Highland has uh, expires in July of this year. Uh, I would expect all boards on the expiration of any Hospedia contracts that they have to be uh, considering uh, best value, but also uh, what is the right patient-centred approach. That is a hallmark of our NHS, uh, and therefore I'd expect Highland to be actively giving consideration at this point to free Wi-Fi services, and I will undertake to work with them and to keep Mr Mountain uh, up to date as we make progress. Question number three, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how a role of universal credit is impacting on local authority rent arrears. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Universal credit has had a devastating impact on people in Scotland. As of November 2018, there were around 135,000 people in Scotland in receipt of UC, 15,000 of which were in the Fife area. COSLA evidence shows that average uh, arrears for those on universal credit are more than 2.5 times the average arrears on those on housing benefit. Whilst we welcome reports that the Westminster vote on universal credit managed migration regulations will now be scaled back to a vote on a pilot scheme for 10,000 people, we will continue to call on the UK Government not to commence managed migration until the fundamental flaws with this catastrophic benefit are fixed. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In Fife, the level of council rent arrears directly attributable to the rollout of universal credit 
currently exceeds 1.1 million. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this increase being suffered by many local authorities will have a devastating effect on planned housing programmes and the continued investment in housing stock across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, David Torrance is quite right to point out to the impact that rent arrears are having uh, to, due to universal credit and the impact they will then have on local authorities. The Scottish Government has introduced the Council House Build programme in April 2009, the first such central government support to councils in a generation, and the most recent published statistics show that a total of 10,293 council homes have now been delivered, including 1,236 council homes in Fife. Council House building continues to be an integral part of the 50,000 affordable homes target over this parliamentary term, which Mr Torrance can be assured that we are determined to meet despite the additional challenges posed by UK government welfare cuts. We will deliver on our promises on housing and on other areas in welfare, despite the budget cuts coming from Westminster and the callous welfare policies administered by the Conservative government. Thank you. Question number four, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the European Health Insurance Card will still be available for residents in Scotland following a no deal Brexit or during any transition period. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Under the withdrawal agreement of 8 December 2017, the current European Union regulations that apply to reciprocal health care, including the European Health Insurance Card, would remain in force during the transition period. The UK Government has responsibility for reciprocal health care on a UK-wide basis. The UK Government believes that the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill could support a broad continuance of existing reciprocal rights, such as European Health Insurance Card, in a no-deal scenario. However, uh, I am obliged to point out that this is a belief on the part of the UK Government. We have seen no evidence to substantiate that, and it is therefore, in my view, yet another reason to remove the option of a no-deal exit from the table. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Brexit mess the Westminster Government has led us into is causing uncertainty at every level and that travelling abroad for leisure or business will create more worry and expense for people in Scotland who did not vote to leave the EU? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I do agree, of course, with, with Ms Mackay that this is yet another area uh, of uncertainty and concern for uh, people who wish to travel uh, overseas or travel into uh, the European Union uh, as a, uh, following Brexit uh, in terms of either business uh, or pleasure or indeed education. We know that many of our fellow citizens, including ourselves, uh, have enjoyed uh, that ease of access. And I think it is important that we recognise that freedom of movement, of course, applies uh, two ways. Uh, we are concerned, quite rightly, about freedom of movement in terms of our capacity to attract uh, the skills and the contribution, the continuing contribution of those EU citizens currently uh, living and working in our country, but it also applies to our citizens' uh, freedom to move across Europe in the manner to which they have become accustomed. And this is yet another example of inadequate planning, a poor approach and the uh, madness that is Brexit. Question number five, Joanne Lamond. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment has made of the potential economic impact of a direct rail link between Glasgow City Centre and Glasgow Airport. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government has not made any recent economic assessment of the impact of a direct rail link between Glasgow City Centre and Glasgow Airport. Uh, the Glasgow City Region Growth Deal includes the Glasgow Airport Access Project, which is being led by the project team from Glasgow City and Renfrewshire Councils. And therefore, responsibility for undertaking an economic impact of the project lies with that team. Joanne Lamond. Thank you for what I would regard as a rather disappointing response. This project has been delayed time and time again, despite numerous assessments that have been undertaken by... Glasgow City Council and the airport demonstrating significant benefits to the wider economy of the west of coast of Scotland. The project is once again at risk. Meanwhile, recent reports show that increasing levels of congestion on the motorway network are increasing journey times to and from the airport. Does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge the significant economic benefits that Glasgow Airport brings 
and that the case for a direct rail link between Glasgow City Centre and the airport grows stronger every year. Can he provide assurances that Transport Scotland and other agencies will work together? And will he now commit to this project and to tell us when he would hope it could be completed? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I'm sorry if the member found my last response disappointing. I'll try to, uh, try to address some of the points which she has raised. I, I very much recognise the important role that the city, the, the Glasgow airport has to the region and to the nation's economy as a whole. And it's in all of our interest to make sure that we improve connectivity between Glasgow city centre and Glasgow airport. Uh, the work that's been taken forward at the present time, looking at the outline business case that was put forward, the further assessment and looking at capacity on the existing Paisley uh, corridor line are all issues that need to be addressed in looking at the possibility of the rail option. I'll be chairing the next meeting of the Glasgow Airport Access uh, Executive Steering Group, which includes the leaders of uh, Glasgow and Renfrewshire uh, Council, along with the other business partners who have an interest in this matter, to look at how we can make further progress with the particular issue about improving access, uh, particularly greater connectivity to uh, Glasgow Airport. John Mason. Uh, thank you. Um, if the, one of the problems, one of the constraints is the capacity at uh, Glasgow Central High Level Station, I wonder if the government would give consideration to Glasgow Crossrail and a station at Glasgow Cross, which would allow some trains to come from Paisley Gilmer Street to stop there. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member is correct in highlighting that there are challenges with any rail-based link between Glasgow Airport and Central station, not only uh, with capacity issues at the station itself, uh, but also with the Paisley Corridor, uh, with approaches at both Arkleston Junction and also Shields Junction, uh, where there are particular constraints uh, which would have to be overcome, which would not be overcome uh, by the Glasgow co Crossrail uh, proposal. But these are matters which have been given very due consideration uh, as part of our overall assessment around delivering on the Glasgow City uh, region growth deal, uh, but also making sure that we get the right type of improved access options from Glasgow City Centre to Glasgow Airport. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have a huge amount of sympathy for Joanne Lamont's question. There's a growing frustration that this project seems to be stalling time after time. We really do need to improve connectivity between that airport and the rest to grow the West Scotland economy. Given some of the impasses that we faced around uh, the impact that the rail link may have on other services, can the uh, Minister commit that his department will uh, fully assist the local authorities who will approve this project to ensure that that impact is minimised, but that this project can indeed make some progress. Cabinet Secretary. Epstein Officer, um, Transport Scotland officials are already engaged with uh, the partners who are looking at taking forward this particular uh, proposal, but it's important we also understand the, the full impact uh, that it could actually have on rail services within uh, the Paisley Corridor area, which could be significantly detrimental uh, to other service users. And that has to be properly understood, uh, not just in those who are using the services from Paisley Gilmore Street, but those who use it uh, in accessing from Ayrshire as well. So that wider piece of work has to consider all of these matters. And that's exactly what's been taken forward at the present moment. Um, I recognise the time frame uh, that some people feel has been too long. However, there are significant complexities around this that have to be properly understood uh, and considered. And the meeting which I chair later uh, this month will give us an opportunity to look at what further progress we can make in the coming months. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister advise as to the benefits to North Ayrshire of having less congestion on the A737 once the rail link is established? And can confirm the work on planning the timetabling of this service is already underway, given concerns expressed to the Local Government and Communities Committee about the time net network rail will take to schedule it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, officer, I'll uh, correspond with the member to give him more specific details on some of the, uh, the points which he has raised, but these are uh, important pieces of work which are about addressing issues around congestion, improving services uh, as well for passengers. Uh, there is a need for, uh, for Network Rail in particular uh, to have a very clear indication of the time frame for taking this forward, uh, and what I will do is provide the member with more uh, specific details in this matter and correspondence. Question number six, June McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what work it is doing to ensure that all public bodies are fulfilling their public sector equality duty with regard specifically to the protected characteristic of sex as represented in the Equality Act 2010. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. 
The Equality Act 2010 is largely reserved. However, a framework to help public authorities meet the requirements of the public sector equality duty has been set by Scottish Minister through regulations. The Scottish Government expects all rel relevant organisations to comply with the requirements of the 2010 Act in relation to all protected characteristics. Responsibility for oversight of compliance with the 2010 Act, including compliance with the 2012 regulations, rests with the Equality and Human Rights Commission. The Commission is independent and cannot be directed by Scottish Ministers. Private individuals may also seek to reinforce their rights under the Equality Act in courts and tribunals. John McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Is she aware of recent research by the academic consultancy Murray Blackburn Mackenzie that found only seven out of the 32 local authorities in Scotland had a clear definition of sex as a protected characteristic, while others conflated sex with gender identity, which is no definition in law, or gender reassignment, which is a completely separate protected characteristic? Many Scottish Government documents also conflate the two. This undermines the Equality Act exemptions which are designed to protect women and girls. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that to support women and girls we need clear data on sex and would she consider issuing guidelines to ensure that every public authority in Scotland adheres to this aspect of the Equality Act 2010? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the protected characteristic of sex in the Equality Act 2010 relates to being a man or a woman. We accept that sex and gender are distinct concepts. The Scottish Government agrees that there is a need to have disaggregated data to allow for the impacts of policies on men and women to be demonstrated. In Scotland, there is both technical guidance and non-statutory guidance on the public sector equality duty uh, for public bo bodies, and that's published by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. The Scottish Government expects all relevant organisations to comply with the requirements of the 2010 Act and with the published guidance. Thank you. Question number seven, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many teachers who are employed using the Attainment Scotland Fund are on permanent contracts. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, of the 962 full-time equivalent teachers funded through the Attainment Scotland Fund, 542 full-time equivalent teachers are recorded as having permanent employment status. Ross Greer. Thank you, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. There are hundreds of teachers employed on temporary contracts under the Attainment Challenge Fund. In many local authorities, 100% of the attainment uh, funded teaching posts are temporary contracts. These contracts don't contribute towards a sustainable teaching workforce. They often prevent staff from accessing opportunities for proper career progression and CPD. Does the Deputy First Minister acknowledge that while making a valuable contribution, attainment funded teaching posts on temporary contracts are no substitute for permanently employed core teaching posts? Uh, I certainly would encourage um, local authorities to employ teachers on a full-time basis. Uh, we have given uh, absolute commitment about the funding stability around the Attainment Scotland Fund over the course of this parliamentary term. That is beyond dispute. And in addition to that, uh, obviously there is regular turnover within the teaching profession and uh, vacancies will arise which can be filled um, as and when they arise. So I think the arguments are compelling. Uh, to make more and more of these posts permanent and I am pleased to see the progress that's been made with the recruitment of 962 full-time equivalent teachers through the Attainment Scotland Fund who are making a contribution to the increase in teacher numbers that we saw last year of 447, which was a welcome increase in the teaching profession in Scotland. Question 8 has not been lodged. Question 9, Colin Beattie. Oh, Colin Beattie, sorry. Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to improve the rail network. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Since 2007, we've invested around £8 billion in infrastructure and services to support Scotland's railways. Uh, we continue to demonstrate our commitment to improving rail infrastructure through the high-level output specification and rail enhancements in capital investment strategy, supported by £4.85 billion investment in control period six an announcement on which rail projects will form the first part of Control Period 6 uh, a portfolio will be made by the end of March this year. Colin Beattie. The Cabinet Secretary will be, will be aware of the recent reports regarding train delays and cancellations. Can you outline what specific steps are being taken to improve both the Musselboro Line and the Borders Railway in the short and long term? Cabinet Secretary. 
As I stated in the Chamber earlier this week, performance on our railways has been unacceptable and that is why I instructed Transport Scotland to serve a contractual notice on ScotRail that it must prepare and submit a remedial plan setting out how they plan to address the performance issues, including on the North Berwick route, which serves Musselburgh and Borders Railway to the contractually required levels. I can assure the member that there is absolutely no lack of determination on my part to ensure that ScotRail keep to the standards that are expected of it as set out in the contract. And I'm determined to ensure that we address that and the remedial plan will assist us in dealing with that issue. Thank you very much. And that concludes uh, topical questions.